Howdy. It's Charles Billingsley, and one of the Bible class teachers for the uh, Livingston Church of Christ located in Livingston, Texas. Uh, we have been looking at the miracles of Jesus and seeking what truths we can find from those stories. And we want to continue that, and the miracle we're going to be considering with this lesson is Jesus cleansing the tan lepers. And uh, we've looked at the, uh, the cleansing of lepers before. We're going to try to bring out some additional things about that. And this is recorded in Luke, the 17th chapter, beginning in verse 11 and going through verse 19. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee, and as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance, and they lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Now then Jesus answered, were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was not one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. So Jesus comes to the city, and I imagine either the beginning or the outskirts of the city because the lepers were to keep their distance. He's approached by ten men who have this terrible disease of leprosy. And it was indeed a terrible disease. They're crying for mercy. It's a painful disease. It's a constant infection that eats away at the flesh. And members of the body would depart the flesh, either ear, nose, fingers, and so forth. And it was just a no-hope situation. They were going to die. And so they indeed are crying for mercy out of their terrible situation. And we read in Leviticus, the 13th chapter, they, of course, were to keep their distance. In verses 45 and 46, the leprous person who has the disease shall wear a torn clothes and let his hair and head uh, hang, hang loose, and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. And he shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean, and he shall live alone he dwelling shall be, and his dwelling shall be outside the camp. So among these lepers, there were 10 Jews, obviously, but one was a Samaritan. The emphasis kept being placed upon. There was a Samaritan that was with them. Ordinarily, Samaritans and Jews were always at odds with one another. They detested each other. They would not congregate together, meet together. But because man needs fellowship, he needs companionship of some sort, and and communication with fellow human beings. Uh, now they're together. There's, when the, because of the uh, disease, there's no racial concerns, there's no concern about prosperity, who a person is, just someone to be with. They were brought down to a common level because of this terrible disease. And so Jesus tells them to go and sow themselves to the uh, priest. It shows that Jesus had a great respect for God's law. It's to be obeyed. It's not just a bunch of religious teaching, but it's God's will for us. And Jesus obeyed the law of the Moses and, and encouraged others to do that. This is encourages us to keep the New Testament scriptures. While they go on to the priest, during that period, they're healed all of a sudden. And, that, and you can just imagine the, the excitement. Uh, they've had this terrible disease. They always feel bad. There's constant fever. There's deterioration of the flesh. There's a stench. And, and plus the ost being ostracized from everyone else, all of a sudden they're healed. They don't have any of that. They probably feel great, or just like the man who came leaping in the temple after being healed uh, for being one who had been a cripple all his life. And knowing from where they came and, 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 uh, and what Jesus has done for them, one of these individuals had to go back and uh, give thanks to Jesus and worship God and praise him. And the reason they were going to the priest, of course, because it was required in the law of Moses. Not all forms of leprosy were incurable. And so if they had the signs of leprosy, and after a while it, it was cured, then they can go back to the priest, be approved uh, to return to society, and they would do that. So that's why Jesus told them to go show himself to the priest. So as they passed, and they, uh, they won, they, all of them are cleansed, but only one comes back. And Jesus makes a statement, once they're ten cleansed, 
Why are there only nine before me? And even that, this one is a Samaritan. This one is a Gentile. This one is a pagan. He comes back and, and gives thanks. What about the Jews who are God's privileged people, goes living to God's covenant people? There are a number of lessons that can be found, I think, from this. And one of the things that, in this story of the healing of these ten lepers, as they cry out for mercy, that implies they, how distraught they are in the situation of their disease. It gives us this picture of sin. I think I've mentioned before in our lesson to do with the cleansing of leprosy, but I, I don't think we can overemphasize it. The fact that what we see in this terrible disease is a picture of what sin does to us spiritually. Someone who said that leprosy was a living parable of sin. They recognized that they needed divine intervention. There was no one way that they would heal. They need God to act in their behalf. And just as we see that we need divine intervention for us to be saved from our sin, it will not take place if we're not for by God's grace who gave his son to die for us. And we see that Jesus was the one they came to uh, crying out for this mercy. And Jesus is the one that responds to us when we come uh, seeking forgiveness of sins uh, because he's, he's a great physician, the spiritual physician. In Luke, the fifth chapter, verses 31 and 32, and Jesus is responding to those who are criticizing him because he dared to mingle with sinners and publicans. He's wanting to teach them. And he tells them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous sinner, but to repent, but the righteous, but the sinner to repentance. And Jesus is our physician who calls us to come from this terrible situation of, of sin. And so recognizing how the leprosy is a very loathsome, painful, and pitiful disease, we really need to see that's what sin does to our soul. It is something that when we're separated from God, as they are separated from the community, it separates and alienates us from God. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 tells us, your sins are separated between you and your God. And that's why it's referred to as death in Ezekiel 18, 20. And also uh, we find in Romans the 6th chapter, verse 23, those sin, the one who sins dies. There's a spiritual separation between him and God. And that has very serious consequences. With the leper, they would just assume me, uh, rather continue to die slowly. Well, that means if we're guilty of sin, we leave this world guilty of sin, we will have an eternal destruction that we'll find. It's, a, it's a, uh, something we need to be concerned about. Uh, we see in Proverbs 15, verse 29, the Lord is far, is, is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. In Revelation 21, verse 8, For as the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as murderers and sexually immoral and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their portion shall be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. Uh, and, and the Bible tells us in many times in describing hell, it's going to be a horrible place. It's called as a darkest of darkness where there's no light whatsoever. It's where the, the worm doesn't cease to, to eat, it says. In other words, there's a constant perpetual pain. Uh, there's an eternal destruction. It decide, tells us how horrible it is to be one who's lost in sin and does not receive the forgiveness of those sins. So we must see sin in that way and not take it lightly. Uh, black leprosy sin is going to also separate us from the righteous. My mother used to have a saying that encouraged us to make sure we keep good company. She says that birds of a feather flock together. And those of similar interests, those of similar desires, desires and philosophies are going to be those who congregate together. Uh, the alcoholics, the druggies, they want to be with other alcoholics and druggies. Uh, homosexuals want to be with those who are homosexuals. We want to be with those that, uh, that adopt our ideas and our philosophies. And that's why the Bible warns us that we must caution ourselves from being too close and intimate with those who are of the ungodly world. That is, we're, we're to be like Jesus, we're to seek to save them, and we're always treating them with courtesy and love and help if they need it. But the, the intimate relationship, the close bond, can cause us to drift their ways. Paul warns in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 17, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? 
Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial or, or Satan? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has a temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will make my dwelling among you and shall walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and then I will welcome you. So God is cautioning us, Paul is cautioning us, that we need to be concern how the world will influence us and not put us in associations and relationships with those who aren't Christians that will play an influence on us to lead us away. As Paul would say in 1 Corinthians the 15th chapter, evil companions corrupt good morals. Just as the 10 lepers of our story had no hope for healing of this terrible disease, so, so sinners have no hope without Christ. If Jesus wasn't there, they wouldn't have been healed of their leprosy. If it wasn't for God out of his grace giving his son to die for us, to be our savior, we would have no salvation. As Paul says in Ephesians 2 and verse 12, that without Christ we're without hope and without God in this present world. In Ephesians 2 and verse 8 it says, by grace have you been saved through faith and that not of yourselves the gift of God. But it wasn't for God's grace, his love and willingness to provide our means of salvation, there would be none. The wage of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Another great passage in Romans the 5th chapter, verse 8, it says that God manifested his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He's the one who provides the salvation. Sin needs to be taken serious, and our need for Christ needs to be aware of it. Satan wants sin to look like it's something that's fun, it's pleasurable, it has no great consequences, but the Bible reveals it has very severe consequences, and only the Lord can save us from it. Like leprosy, sin brings pain and misery to our lives. Think of the fact that drunkenness and alcoholic addiction brings misery and terrible consequences to people who pursue those things. It destroys the body, it causes the sinner to become uh, cruel and selfish and undependable. And it's tongue, the sins of the tongue, like lying, and gossip, and slander, well, they destroy friendships, they destroy reputations, they divide homes, they divide churches. Consider murder, theft, adultery, sexual morality, covetousness, jealousy, hatred, and every other sin you could possibly think of. They all bring pain and they all bring uh, the things that hurt us and hurt others, hurt us as sinners and those who are the they're, they're subject of our sin. So the ten lepers, as we look at this story, we find that they were delivered uh, on an equal plane with one another. They were Jews and Samaritan. Now they're lepers. And sin does that to us. It takes away any racial bias. It takes away any uh, prominence, a distinction. When we stand before God, we stand before God as sinners in need of salvation. Uh, those who sin are on a common level before God. They're without hope. And we'll all be accountable to God. Remember, my Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 9, verse 27, it's appointed to men once to die, and after that comes a judgment. That means if we continue lost in sin, if we don't come to God for salvation, we're going to stand before God unprepared. 2 Corinthians 5, 10 says, For we know that we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an answer for what we've done in the body, whether it be good or whether it be evil. From the story of the miraculous healing of the ten lepers, we also see a lesson uh, concerning their being cured. Uh, we read in the inspired narrative that the lepers were traveling and they were healed. It is only by the grace of God, of course, that they were healed. It wasn't a natural healing. It only is by God's intervention here through Christ. Had not Jesus miraculously done this, they, they would have died as lepers in that painful way. In the same way, so we're saved by God's grace. It's a wonderful, precious gift. It's by his love, deep love for us, and mercy he extends toward us. And I, and I encourage us to always never treat that as a, as a trite matter. Never treat that as something uh, in not giving the most reverent consideration. To think of how God in the depth of his grace gave his son 
to think of the depth of his love, the unfathomable love of God to love us that much, to think of Jesus as our Savior, his willingness to go to the cross and die a terrible death just for me, just for my sin. I need to be aware of that, thankful for that, just as this Samaritan was thankful for being cured of that horrible disease. We read from this sacred gospel account also the miracle of the ten lepers that they were crying for mercy. They needed mercy from the only place they could receive it. That was from Jesus Christ. I think the lesson there as far as we, of course, when uh, sinners need to seek mercy of God because we can't save ourselves. Before God will save us by his grace, in fact, we need to come to him. We need to appeal for mercy. As Paul quotes Job 2, verse 32, he says, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Those who come to God for salvation are the ones that will be saved. We have to come to him for that. We need to imitate the Jews of Jesus' day on the day of Pentecost. And, and Jesus, rather, the Jews on the day of Pentecost when they heard that first gospel sermon, realizing they had crucified the Son of God. They realize their condition and they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Or think of the Philippian jailers. He speaks to Paul, sir, what must I do to be saved? Or we can think of even the publican in the story of the publican and the Pharisee was praying. And the publican would not lift his eyes in the heaven, but he smote his breast saying, God, be thou merciful to me, a sinner. We need to recognize our need for mercy and grace and to seek that from God. Also we need, uh, as the, like the ten lepers, we see that they receive the mercy of God's healing by meeting the conditions that he set forth. He's, they ask for mercy, they ask for healing, and he says, go show yourself to the priest. Had they not gone to the priest, they wouldn't have been healed on the way. So it is with all who would be cleansed by the blood of Christ, the precious blood of Christ, we must obey the conditions that God has set forth to receiving that salvation, and, and which includes, of course, faith. Uh, we have to have faith in God. Hebrews eleven six says, Without faith it's impossible to be completely pleasing to God, for he that comes to God must believe that he is and rewards those who seek after him. We have to have faith in Jesus as the Christ, the Savior, the one who died for me, because Jesus says in John 8 and verse 24, Except you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. We have to have faith. But also we need to repent. We need to be determined to turn from the sins in our lives to living righteously before God. And Jesus really brings that home in a statement, Luke 3, uh, 13, verse 3. Except you repent, you will perish. And notice that acceptive clause there. He says, you're going to perish. The only exception is you must repent. If you don't, there is no salvation. But also we find that we need to make our confession of our faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus tells us if we deny him before men, he'll deny us before the Father. But if we confess him before the men, he'll confess us before the Father. We cannot be ashamed and we must be openly willing to confess the name of Christ. And this is required of those who have become Christians. Paul says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, with the, mouth, and with the heart man, but man believes in the righteousness but with the mouth, confession is made into salvation. So we must have faith, we must repent, we must confess, but also it is essential for us to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. And that means being immersed in water. The Ethiopian says, here's water, what hinders me to be baptized. So baptism is in water, but it's not by a sprinkling or a pouring, but it's by an immersion within it. That's the real meaning of the word baptism, from baptizo, dip, plunge, or immerse. And this can be seen in descriptions of baptism in Colossians and Romans, the sixth chapter. It's described as a burial. We must be buried or immersed in water to be saved. And for, the command goes is not just to be baptized, but be baptized for the forgiveness of sins in order to receive the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. For the Christian, he also has a need to seek mercy and God's forgiveness. And we're all going to sin. We we can't live a perfect life. We always have this challenge of temptation and sin in cases we're going to fall. John tells us that in 1 John in the first chapter. He says, let no man say, I don't sin. He does sin. But also, we must not take that for granted, but immediately repent.
repent of that and ask God's forgiveness is Simon the sorcerer who had been converted to Christ was told after he had sinned, repent of this and ask God's forgiveness and pray for forgiveness. The Apostle Paul warns the Jews who would not respond to the conditions of salvation, who would not hear the gospel. He says, since you thrust it from you, you count yourself unworthy of eternal life. Acts 13, verse 46. Remember on the day of Pentecost, after the Jews had asked what they must do to be saved, and Peter says, repent and be baptized, forgiveness of sins. We read a few verses later, and with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, save yourself from this crooked generation, so that we, those that received his word were baptized. And are adding to that day about 3,000 souls. Another passage that brings out the importance of baptism is in Acts 22, 16. Saul, who became the apostle Paul, was one who did not have faith in Jesus, and he opposed Christians. And when Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus, now seeing Jesus, he's the resurrected Savior, he believes because he says, Lord, what would you have me do? And God tells him to go to Damascus, and he'll send someone to tell him. And when Ananias comes to him, he says, why do you tarry, Paul? Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling the name of the Lord. We must meet the conditions of salvation. In this story of the miracle, we also read that the only, only one of these lepers were healed and, uh, as they go to the priest. And Jesus emphasized it. He was a foreigner. He was a Samaritan. Look at Luke 17, 15, 16. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving thanks to him. Now he was a Samaritan. And then Jesus asked, is the Samaritan this far the only one that's coming forward? We observe that the Samaritan was one who was grateful. That's an important thing, being a person who's grateful and thankful for God's blessings. His voice of prayer after his healing became a voice of praise. With a loud voice, he had begged for mercy. And now with a loud voice, he thanks God and thanks the Lord for the mercy that he's received. He was abundantly blessed indeed. He No longer is he going to die of a leper. And all the, the, the things that are characteristic of being a leper uh, have left him. And we say that he was an alien, though. He wasn't a Jew. He wasn't those who were trained to teach, to follow the teachings of, of, of the Messiah. He's reminding of the, uh, well, let's go a little bit further. We see that the Samaritan was not only abundantly blessed, and he became even more blessed as he came back and received thanksgiving from the Lord. Jesus commands the, commends rather the, the, the Samaritan and he rebukes the Jews in the same uh, sentence. And he says, then Jesus said, were not ten cleansed, where are the nine? Was there not one found to return to give praise to God except the foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go away, your faith has made you whole. So the, uh, the, the similarity I want to bring out about this is, uh, it, it's similar to, for instance, the tax collector. When there was a tax collector and a Pharisee praying in the temple, that the, the Pharisee just prayed to himself, thanking God of how great he was, but the tax collector would, lift, would not allow his eyes to lift up and smote his breast and cry, crying to God, be thou merciful to me, a sinner. And the similarity between is that the, the thankful Samaritan was like the tax collector, they were humble before God. They know that they need the blessings of God and they're thankful for them when those blessings indeed come. And I think that is really important because I have seen on a number of occasions when people were close to God, when they were in trial and tragedies, but once that's gone, they, they forget about God. There are many a person who have become a, a Christian. They appeal to God's mercy. They want forgiveness. They want the freedom of guilt of sin and knowing their children of God with the hope of eternal life. But after becoming a Christian, they turn to somewhat of a wishy-washy Christian life instead of being a devout child of God. We see in Acts 17, chapter, verse 28, we're to be a thankful people. For in him we live and we move and have our being. He blesses us abundantly. In Ephesians 1, verse 3, we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In Ephesians 1, and verse 7, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, paid for by his blood. 
In Romans 8 and verse 28, we're told, that, we're told that we know that those who love God, all things will work together for their good as those who call upon him. And Peter even reminds us of the great blessings we have as we look to the future with that hope of eternal life in 1 Peter 1, 3, and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has begotten us to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And he tells us that we're looking for an inheritance that's imperishable, that's undefiled, that's unfading, that will be kept for us in heaven. So the Christian needs to be someone who is thankful because just as the psalmist says, our cup runs over, we're abundantly blessed. And God would have us to be thankful. First Thessalonians 5, 17 and 18 Pray without ceasing, give thanks to God in, uh, in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. The nine ungrateful lepers were nearer to Christ in their affliction than they were in their health. They prayed when they had distress, but they were silent when they received a relief from their illness. They were Jews, they were privileged people, and, and making uh, them well, I mean, rather they're in gratitude even, I think, worse because they should be expected to come to him for thanksgiving. They had a faith enough to be healed but not enough love to return to God and thank him for that healing. They were like many today who, I say, they become Christian. They saw the need for salvation, but they do not follow up with a faithful Christian life. Paul tells us in Ephesians, better in chapter 4 and verse 1, we're to walk in a way that is worthy of our calling. We're to be faithful Christians, faithful disciples of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Christians are also described in 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, but you're a chosen race, a loyal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you might proclaim the excellencies of him before others. Christ's life and his thankful life is lived thankfully before him. If uh, it is wise for us to heed Paul's exhortation to examine ourselves to see whether we're in the faith, we need to take a look at ourselves. Am I really a thankful Christian? Am I living that before God? Am I involving myself in his work? Do I attend services and classes faithfully? Am I striving to grow as a Christian in my character? Am I spending time in, in, in prayer, in Bible study? In other words, am I involved in a thankful living before God? Ingratitude describes an attitude that is wicked. Romans 1 verse 21, For although they knew God, they did not honor God nor give thanks. So in conclusion from the story of the miracle, we can learn several things. From the ten who sought cleansing, we need to seek cleansing from God for our sins. From the Savior... We learned uh, that uh, he cleanses us and he's the source of our salvation and our hope and our only hope. From the Samaritan, we can see the duty of being grateful. From the nine who are ungrateful, we can see the ugliness of this type of sin and not being thankful to God and expressing it in our lives. I hope this study has been beneficial for you and join me again for a future study.